They are the gatherers of misfortune. In the humid undergrowth of the Bolivian jungle, a family harvests the rotten shells from giant almond trees. Here, Roma. There are lots here. They're all fallen down there. The place is infested with insects and snakes. And Janko, the eldest of the siblings, no longer wants to plunge in his hands. I picked up the shells with this stick. It's to protect me from scorpions, spiders. Often you can mistake snakes for, for the shells. When I was little, a snake bit me, and I had to spend a month in bed. I couldn't walk, the poison was that strong, and I also lost my sight. Janko's wife, Claudia, has never been bitten and harvests with bare hands, but her great fear is tarantulas. They can sting, and sometimes it can be deadly. For hours, the whole family works to the point of collapse, collecting the shells under the giant almond trees. Look, it's 40 or 50 meters high. A shell may fall and smash your skull. You could die. This year, there were three deaths in our area. The shells are too heavy to be carried. They must be opened to extract the nuts containing the almonds that are exported worldwide. But cutting the shells requires great dexterity and the blade of the machete is sharp and dangerous. I've cut myself. My finger was too close to the blade. I'm here because I have no choice, and I don't like the forest. Everything is rotten here. Everything is tiring. This forest is horrible. I have no fond memories of this place. At the end of the day, they filled two bags with almonds. They're much too heavy. It's impossible to carry. It weighs 80 kilos. Here, though, nature often provides the solution. In a few moments, the bark of a tree becomes a solid harness. The tropical rain threatens to erase all traces of the trail. The family decides to leave the deep forest as soon as they can. Legend has it that those who get lost in the jungle at night will lose their souls and wild beasts will devour their bodies. way home, the young couple who've known each other since childhood already knows the bag of almonds will not provide enough money for the whole family. And it's no longer possible to collect any more because the torrential rains will turn the forest into a quagmire for weeks. Since the death of his parents, Janko, aged 26, is the head of the family and has 15 mouths to feed. Janko therefore gave up his medical studies and Claudia her dreams. Janko's younger brother, Roma, aged 18, will go to the university in his place. But there's just been some bad news. We haven't the money to pay for his university enrollment. We must send it now because he can't miss this opportunity. They want 63 euros. 63 euros? 
What's wrong? The university is making our lives difficult. Looking for a solution, Janko tries to negotiate his crop with a village cooperative for more than the usual price. So, how much money do you want then? Give me 58 euros. No, nope, you'll get 42, and that's it. 42 euros, or 25 cents a kilo, a miserable price that won't be enough to pay for Roma's university. The ever lower rates mean Bolivian harvesters remain poor. The precious almonds begin a perilous journey through the Bolivian Amazon to the capital, La Paz. A cargo that is transported in appalling conditions. Don't lean out. The road is impractical. It's horrible. Factories that make huge profits from the toil of thousands. It hurts. The hands, the arms. Thousands of tons of almonds that sell abroad for a hundred times the price given to the harvesters. And in Bolivia, there's another treasure plundered in the forest, wood. It makes me sad to see so much wood cut down. It's a massacre that disrupts the ecosystem, causing unprecedented disruptions to the climate. It's really bad. It keeps rising and rising. There's a consignment of almonds that might rot due to the moisture. To avoid losses, Edgar must deliver them as quickly as possible to a processing plant. No. But he's just found out his tank is empty and has to buy fuel from a colleague. Well, yesterday some villagers stole my gasoline. Despite his troubles, Edgar is happy because for once, he won't make the trip alone. Thank you, my friend, thank you. A taxi has just dropped off his son, whom he hasn't seen in months. How are you? What? To young Alan, his father's blue truck is a fabulous toy. I'm really glad. This is the first time I'm traveling with him. The last time he was a baby, he was only five months old. Oh, look how big he is now. Lord, bless my family and my truck, and that everything goes well, according to your will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Edgar was divorced a year ago. He lives alone, and this trip, during the school holidays, is the only opportunity to see his son, Alan. He was always asking me, Dad, take me, I want to go with you. I was very moved, and I missed him, so I'm taking with him now. In three days' time, it's back to school for Alan, 1,370 kilometers away. If he's late, Edgar's afraid his ex-wife will no longer allow him to see his son. But it's the rainy season, and the track through the forest has already flooded, slowing the traffic. At the bottom of this descent, a truck is stuck. Mm 
Can I pull you with the cable? In the sweltering heat, the animals are suffocating, and to overcome fatigue, the driver's chewing coca leaves. We're very upset. We're stuck here. We need to get the pigs to the village quickly. Look, there's one who's already died on the way. I don't want any more to die. The driver keeps trying, only to get bogged down even more. That truck down there will fall over. We'll attach a rope and then pull it out. And of course, it works. Because for Alan, his father is a superman. My dad came here and he was able to pull out the truck. Looking at his son, Edgar remembers the dreams that made him choose this job. Ever since I was little, I always wanted to be a driver. I had tiny toys. I made them out of odds and ends with wood and plastic. And I liked inventing roads where there was danger, things like that. Edgar is not the owner of his truck. And once he's paid off the hire, the fuel and the food, this trip will make him barely enough to live on. Don't lean out. A customer pays two euros per bag. It's not enough because I owe money to the bank. Liabilities that were incurred as a result of an accident. In Bolivia, there's no insurance and drivers are responsible for their cargo and have to pay for it if it's damaged. My truck slid over onto its side and tipped over. And then it started to rain. I was carrying vegetables, and the whole cargo was spoiled. Edgar must avoid another accident at all costs, but it's not so easy on this road full of obstacles. There's a big hole and everybody falls in. They're trying to fill it in because too many cars have got stuck. The truck is blocked. Left to his own devices, Alan decides to walk through the ditches on the side of the road. And he also soon gets bogged down in the sticky mud. Come on, let's go. It's okay, come on. But Alan seems to slow down on purpose. Don't hold on like that. Yes, no, you'll fall. I won't. Exhausted, Edgar hopes his son will have a better future than his own. I don't want him to become a trucker. As he says, when I grow up, I want to be a soldier. I hope his dream comes true. It's my dream too. There's another test that now awaits Edgar. He must cross a tributary of the Amazon, the Rio Beni. This year, exceptional rains have caused massive flooding and Edgar gets stuck again. I can't get across. There's no ferry. I'll see if there's another way out. The dock has disappeared under the water. There are no boats to cross the river. The wait is interminable, and there's not much in the way of food. This used to be my restaurant. 
where I was serving fried fish, corn, peanuts. Now all there is is mud, mud from the river, and nothing else. Edgar won't find anywhere to rest either. I can't find the words to express how I feel. I get a lump in the throat just thinking that we'll have to take everything off. It's each man for himself, and even the tarantula doesn't know what to do. With flooding comes disease, diarrhea, malaria, vomiting, typhoid, dengue, not to mention snake bites. A ferry struggling against the current finally arrives. Edgar is one of the first to board, but there's not enough room for everyone. There's room for two trucks, really, but they're trying to get three on. They're trying to fit it in. The bus is too long, so the sailors let the rear wheels rest on the fragile and rusty ramp. The usual practice is to try and get on as many customers as possible, ignoring safety. Crammed together, the passengers suffocate in the heat. My pigs aren't used to this heat. This breed doesn't like the sun. There's no air conditioning, so it's down to basics. With an ancient engine and a very strong current, maneuvering is tricky. It's rained a lot in Peru, and that affects the rivers in Bolivia. The river is swollen, and that's dangerous. From ferry to ferry, Edgar stutters along, and on the last, which is almost a wreck, a cable snaps. I don't know what's happening. It might be a mechanical problem. They say that a cable on the pontoon is broken. The boat is out of control. The ferry is no longer being pulled. And it begins to drift. It's dangerously close to the banks of the river. The steering cable is finally repaired, and at the last moment, the pilot manages to safely guide the ferry across. After three days and 445 kilometers, Edgar completes the first stage of his journey at River Alta. It's mostly a waste of time, really, and also of money, because every day we take, all the expenses will come out of my pocket. It's a real loss of income. Isolated and near the Brazilian border, the small town of Ribeiralta grew as a result of the rubber, gold and timber industries. Today, 100,000 people live in these muddy streets and depend on their livelihood on 10 almond processing plants. Millions of the precious nuts arrive every day at this warehouse. Because of the damp, many rot even before they're opened. 
be dried, they have to be ventilated, but since there is no breeze, the employees are constantly moving the mountains of the almonds around. And as soon as it's completed, the operation is immediately repeated at the other end of the workhouse. We're sick. We have headaches. And that's due to the heat. We can't breathe here. In this polluted atmosphere, bacteria often contaminate the almonds. Maya, the director of the factory, tries to deal with this on a shoestring. We're entering a, a white area. We have to use uniforms with aprons and headwear now. Now I'm ready to go into the workplace. And inside, 1,000 workers, mostly women, are manually dissecting the almonds. In here, 50,000 to 70,000 kilos of almonds a day are shelled by hand. We weigh what they've shelled and they're paid by the kilo. They get about 38, 39 cents a kilo. And according to what they produce, they can earn between 300 and 740 euros a month. In fact, several members of the same family are taking it in turns on a single machine. And the real wages per person are less than 300 euros a month. That's the case of Tita, 18, who's worked here for two years. I'm in my final year at school, and I would like to go on to medical school. I help my grandmother. She's paid 210 euros a month, and of that she gives me 52. 52 euros are barely enough to buy clothes, not, not to mention all the rest. I work here from 6 in the morning until noon and then from 2 in the afternoon till 6, when I go to school. The employees repeat the same gestures all year round. The almond is hard, it hurts your hands. It ruins the skin and we can get hurt. It's really hard work. Paid by the kilo of shelled almonds, the workers never rest and quickly develop serious illnesses. It hurts your back and your arms. Everything hurts. The almonds will continue their journey to the shelves of the world's finest delicatessens, where they will be sold for 25 euros a kilo, almost 100 times the worker's salary. For his part, Edgar has just learned that the road to La Paz is flooded and impassable. He doesn't know how he'll get Alan back in time for the new school year. The unseasonable rains continue, and the Rio Beni has now flooded millions of hectares. The main road to the capital is submerged. The country is split into two. The current has swept away the road for dozens of kilometers. Travelers are trapped on islands with no way off. You can't go. It's impassable. It's been a week that we've been stuck here. And we've got nothing to eat, and my cargo is rotting away. The driver's wives cook for everyone. Do you have drinking water for cooking? No, not drinking water. We collect rainwater from the tents. We've been here four days, and it's taken a month to get here from River Alta. A month to cover 400 kilometers? Yes, because of all the holes in the road. With no outside help, some attempt the impossible, to find a way out.
We're using stones to fill the holes and get through. We have to dig by hand, it's the only way. We have to do this, no one else is going to help us. Well, there's no money for roads, you know. They won't send the machines. They have them, but there's no money to pay for fuel. Nevertheless, the villagers try their utmost to make it work. I've got to get to a meeting in Crucerito. And behind, others try to return home to save at least some business. Careful not to fall. There's a hole. It's deep. We were meant to leave two weeks ago. Nobody here can say, I'm dry. There's nothing left, nothing to eat. Everything has been swept away. Here, take the stick. Thousands of victims take refuge above water level. Here, two families live either side of a canvas. <laughs> In these conditions, food is a problem, and most resort to eating the local wildlife. This is a boar's head. The animals take refuge in the hills. So we go hunting, and it provides enough food for several days. On the road, some intrepid drivers try forcing their way through before their cargo rots. But after 200 meters, Damn. It's deep, it's deep. A few kilometers further on, the bridge on the main road has collapsed. The force of the waters make matters worse. And a flimsy bridge is all that connects the two banks. Ramiro, who's transporting timber, inspects the damage. At the foot of the bridge, the army is trying to create a way through. I've been waiting two days. They're trying to deal with the deepest part so we can get past. The passengers on this bus, however, are less hopeful. We're unloading the goods that were meant for Rurabenke. Why? Because it'll never get through here. This will take a while. There's too much water. In order to transfer their goods, they risk the small bridge. Miro, taking the truck any further, becomes very uncertain. And the hardest part is waiting. You lose patience waiting that long. You begin to complain. But hey, my truck is my hotel. I have my bed, I have stuff to eat, got my clothes. But we just need the water levels to drop and then we can cross the river. But it may take some time, and if it rains, we can do nothing about it.
and the downpour continues throughout the whole region. Cities are flooded, and within days, Bolivia has more than 100,000 victims. At Rurenabaque, the Rio Beni continues to swell and submerges the entire city. It's really bad. It keeps rising and rising. People will soon have to leave. The locals are poorly equipped to defend themselves against the flood. I've raised the bottom of the door. This is my home and also my store. Excuse me, excuse me. The sewers are overflowing everywhere. The only way to reach the road to the capital is to cross the Rio Beni in a canoe. For La Paz, let's go, we're leaving. Come on, cut, get across, just for a few cents. But it takes courage and recklessness to cross a river in full flood. When the waves are like this, the tip of the boat has to go straight into them. Otherwise, we could capsize. And if the engine stops, we've got oars. Oars. If we hit a tree, no problem. It'll just pass under the boat. And what if a passenger falls overboard? He'll swim. And what if he can't? And that's why we have life jackets. The crossing takes only seven minutes, but it's seven minutes of panic. At any moment, a tree trunk may come along and seal everyone's fate. At the foot of the bridge, each load of dirt is immediately swept away by the current. There's about a meter of water. It's dangerous because the current is so strong. And while some still hope to get across, Ramiro has his doubts. I think the water's still way too high. Four hours later, the army bulldozer helps a bus carrying soldiers to cross the river. Can only help the bus across. Only one bus? Yes, only one, because it's full of soldiers who are being redeployed. What they see as special treatment angers those who've been waiting for days. Let us across. Let us cross. Let the bus go. We want to cross. I'm trying everything to help. It's OK. They just want to cross first. We've been here for two weeks. More than two weeks. We've been on the road for three weeks. We want to get over and get to La Paz. A second bus with more military also crosses. We truckers mean nothing. Those passengers get priority. No one cares about those of us with goods to transport. 
According to the authorities, it doesn't matter if we stay here for days or weeks. Fed up of waiting, Ramiro risks everything, including being swept away by the current. My truck weighs 55 tons. Come on, I'm going to make it. With a 55-ton truck, if he gets stuck, he'll never get out. We got through. Ramiro must now get across a mountain area eroded by deforestation. But all the illegal timber traffic has devastated the tortuous road that's been waterlogged for weeks. I've never transported illegal timber. It's too risky. If the forest rangers or police get you, they can confiscate the truck. And I'm sad that cutting so many trees has destroyed the forest. This road is in very poor condition. There are a lot of landslides and one must be really careful, because if you're not, you can tip over. The rain doesn't stop, and Bolivia slowly sinks into a major natural disaster. There seem to be landslides everywhere. In Ruranabaque, a dozen people have been buried alive. The house was over there, down here. Here, six families lost everything, their home. They have nothing left. From, from my house, it looked like an explosion. The hill did like this. I shouted, don't go up there, the hill is sliding down. But they didn't listen, and they ran up to over there. And there was a second landslide, and they were buried. I was trying to help others when I was buried, crushed under a house. I was completely buried under the mud. I managed to stretch out a hand, and they saw me. My friend had her leg ripped off. Others lost their lives, their, their children, their wives, and also four soldiers who had come to rescue people were killed. Ramiro's route is turning into a journey into hell, marked by the memory of the flood victims. 38 in all in Bolivia. They're towing trucks up there. It must be a landslide. We got stuck overnight. We ran into trouble on the way up. This road is impassable, it's horrible. You can't travel on it. You'll never know when you'll get to your destination. No, no, forward, go forward.
Vamos, vamos right, I'll try to get through now. Within weeks, four years of work and millions of dollars to rebuild this road are reduced to nothing. I'm depressed. How can our roads be in this state? The rains destroyed everything. I'm sorry for my country. Our work is like a sacrifice. We leave our homes, our wives, to come and work in these conditions. Anxious to get home to La Paz, Ramiro perseveres. Exceeding the limits and taking risks, which in the past cost him dearly. My worst memory? Oh, it's when I was a young driver. I was carrying beer. As a cargo, beer is not stable. It sways in every direction, and I almost turned over. I had to unload all the beer to get the truck out. I lost money because almost the entire cargo was damaged. The beer had turned into mud. Oh, great. Yet another problem. This is the worst. I'm completely stuck. The delay seems endless until, out of the fog, a bulldozer gives some hope. If you go too quickly, it's not good. And too slow, it's not good either. The trick is to find the right speed. The more the heavy goods vehicles force their way through, the deeper the ruts. And on the edge of the road, vehicles with lower chassis are good and stuck. I'm with my children. We have no more food, but we're getting by. We'll try to get to the village to eat, or at least try to eat. To make any progress, the central bank has to be overcome, meter by meter, by hand. Once you've launched yourself, there's no chance to break. Ramiro is making slow progress towards La Paz, but now it's a whole hill that's swept down over the road. It's incredible. The entire hill's collapsed, everything. There's no way through that. They have to fix this first. And that's going to be a lot of work. Excuse me, do you know how long it'll take? No. A landslide has swept away the road, 100 meters below. And this road had just been built. Now there's nothing left of it. No, oh, it's sad. The travelers are angry. They say the road was poorly constructed. They're just filling it up with stones and compacted gravel. Nothing more. 
And when it's finished, the road will soon be ruined again. Maintenance teams are overwhelmed and are trying to open a temporary track. Well, the problem is that at any moment it will collapse, especially if the rains continue. As you can see, the rain, the water, is, is still rushing through here. But will people get through? Yes, but at their own peril. It's very dangerous. Look, it's still sliding down. It'll take us three or four days to make the road safe. But the travelers have no choice but to brave the danger. These leaves are covered with ants. Be careful. We'll walk and try to get La Paz. La Paz is still 200 kilometers away. Stuck on the other side, the truckers are fed up and now want to try their luck. Gentlemen, I ask you to turn back towards a safer place. If it rains tonight, this entire section will collapse. But if you want to try it, go for it. It's dry here. The road is dry. It's good here. The ground's hard. No, it's not hard. Yes, we can cross here. Look, the next time it rains, this will crumble away. That is why we must remove all of this first. Come on, Mr. Engineer, you have to understand our situation. But my understanding won't make miracles. You think I can just click my fingers and it'll be OK? I wonder when I'll get home. <laughs> In this weather, you never know when you'll finally arrive. Ramiro will have to wait it out another four days before being able to continue. Thirty-eight hundred meters above sea level, La Paz, the capital of the Andes, barely emerges from under the deluge. Young Alan made it back to class, but was one week late. With Edgar, his father, they were flown home by an air bridge set up by the government. Fortunately, we came back on a plane because there are people who drove and they still haven't made it back. With his truck stuck in the Amazon, Edgar has no vehicle and has to earn his living doing odd jobs. I can't drive and it's my only job. I'm a driver without work. How am I going to feed my family? After two days of rest and anxious to support his family, Ramiro is already preparing to leave again. You have to leave again tomorrow? But it's still raining so much. And what state are the roads in? I guess they're open now. I heard on the news that they've collapsed and the roads are bad. I'm worried, you know. Yes, but the truck is loaded and I have to leave tomorrow. I have to leave tomorrow. Madrecita, 
Holy Virgin, I pray to you again today. I ask for the rain to stop so he can drive and that I can worry less than I do now. So protect him so he will return home without problems. We're waiting for him. I feel lonely when he is not here. But it's his work. He has to travel.